Hello, hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you for those who showed up. If you uh, would love to see all your faces, if uh, if we can, so if you if you're able to, it'd be great to see who's here as more people begin to to join us. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Hi, Michael. Lou, can you hear me? Are you there? And Kate as well. It'd be great if we could see you. I appreciate it if you if you guys are. There we go. Thanks, Gareth. Amazing. Well, some more people might roll in. We did expect around 60. Um, so we'll see. Netflix has got some good series on at the moment. So eight o'clock at night is a tricky one. <laughs> so I appreciate you all for being here. Um, brilliant. Thank you, Lou. Okay, so let's get straight into it, shall we? Because I don't want to keep you for too long tonight. Um, this is a great opportunity um, for, for you all to sort of see what, what's been taking up my time and what my focus and passion has been about. And I hope that, uh, we, you know, tonight I can impart some, some knowledge, some ideas, some thought, and yeah, be very a thought-provoking experience, hopefully. Um, that can be passed on. I'll be running events uh, of this nature um, again, so we can always, you know, share this and keep an eye out for, um, as you have done through LinkedIn, for more information coming on that. Um, but for now, I'm going to share the screen and take you all through this event tonight. Okay. And I'll, keep, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat as we go on the chat box. So if you do have any comments, anything you want to, uh, you know, any questions that we're going to, you want to ask, I, there will be a, a definite pause um, in this presentation. So you guys can, can sort of ask there, but we can for sure backlog those questions as they come in. So we don't disrupt the flow too much. Okay. So prodigal sons becoming the men that we need. It's, um, this uh, the event tonight. Basically, the basic outline what we should expect um, tonight is uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of a backstory about myself, who I am. Um, we're going to take into dive into a little bit of the the boys to men process, um, what it means in this modern day, and and how we may be getting it wrong, and hopefully with this presentation show you how we could do it right. Um, we're going to have a discussion halfway through about the crisis itself or what is, can be known as the boy crisis as well. Um, and I'm gonna offer the solution in the form of the Prodigal Sons program. Um, and some will go into the practicalities of the program and, and how and how it's um, laid out and, uh, and how it's actually executed. And some discussion at the end about the upcoming enrollment process and, and when that program is gonna start. So a little bit about me. My name's Adam Gornow. Um, I, was, I was born in Bedford, England, uh, but at an early age, the age of two, I moved to Tenerife with my mother after she divorced uh, my father. Um, and initially it was, a, it was a great, great experience, you know, living on the island of Tenerife, um, the weather, the culture, the food, the experience was, was on the whole incredible. But I did experience violence at home in the form of a stepfather who later became an alcoholic and was witnessed. I witnessed, you know, uh, things that children probably should never witness. Um, and, and it really did uh, shape my early years uh, in, in relation to, to women, in relation to, to men, in relation to violence. And um, it definitely shaped me as a person. Um, eventually, I ended up leaving um, around the age of 15. Uh, I didn't get great qualifications at school in Tenerife and eventually went to, to the UK and lived with my father for a couple of years. I went to college in, in Ipswich, um, but in my second year of college, I discovered through a strategically placed poster in the Royal Marines recruitment office. Um, and you know, I was drawn into that poster and I immediately went into the recruitment office and pretty much signed up on the spot, um, much to the dismay of my father, um, which who, you know, later uh, would go on to sort of 
discouraged me as best as he could from joining. But that really became um, my mission to impress my father, my longing at the time as a child to be connected to my father, to to receive his love, I guess, and support. Um, I would do all kinds of things in, in order to impress him, as I thought I would I needed to. And one of those things was a drastic measure of joining the Marines, um, which I went on to complete. And, um, you know, this this began my rites of passage um, from the age of 17, um, eventually passing out of the age of 18, close to 19. But it was an incredibly challenging experience for me in the early days. And I... Um, I, I struggled. I struggled with my identity of who I was measured against these men that I had been thrust into, into the big boys world, as it were. And I really struggled. I really struggled for, for a quite, a, quite a long time before 9-11 happened. And with war beckoning, um, it all became a little bit too much, to say the least. And I, you know, in those in those dark, dark days, I became I became very insular. I isolated myself in my unit. Uh, eventually, um, I my world got so small that I attempted to take my own life. And it was miraculously um, for the intervention of another Marine that I that I didn't die. Um, I went on to have a, you know, a pretty stellar military career for 10 years. And it really, the, the, the Royal Marine family um, took care of me and rehabilitated me. I went on to, to, to get married, to have two beautiful sons. And later, once I left the Marines, I experienced, I guess, another rites of passage, and that's divorce. And that in itself is, is something that, that, that some men um, have to go through or go through an experience and it can become an incredibly debilitating ordeal so really that was five years ago the divorce and 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 since then it was has been a journey to to come home and uh, to myself to who i authentically was and who could who i could not be in the marines as it turned out um and so i dedicated myself to uh, psychology, studying psychology, uh, eventually becoming qualified as a hypnotherapist and dedicated my life to serving others. And that is my purpose now. You know, I find deep peace through a life of service to others. Um, that service started in the Marines, but it's, it's something that is always with me and, and has given me great, great joy. And I do this for a variety of things. I'm involved in a program called Kids EQ. Um, this is a, 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 a established organization that is hoping to educate, emotionally uh, educate children, which is really where some of these future problems really are seeded from. And so, you know, Kids EQ is, is an incredible program that then really ties into the Prodigal Sons program where we, we see young men um, about to become uh, in, independent and, and go out into the big wide world on their own. It's, a, it's an incredibly important transition period. I also dedicate my, my life to the returning warriors, those veterans who are going through a reverse transition, if you like, going back from, uh, going from warriors to civilians and reintegrating into civilian life without that camaraderie, without that brotherhood around them. It can be an incredibly debilitating and un. And, you know, unstabilizing experience. Um, I also support the government, in particular DEFRA, um, with some of their uh, project race, in particular, their racial programs and inequality uh, and, and diversity, which is incredibly challenging, as you could imagine, um, but, but definitely rewarding to be involved at a government level in, in those projects. And I'm also the cultural director of FreeMind. FreeMind is uh, an incredible organization headed up by Tom Fortes, mayor, and that his, his modalities of, of hypnosis um, combined with incredible music has had profound um, changes, not, to my, not just to my life, but to thousands of others. And we incorporate this in helping many of my clients. So the boy crisis, as described by Warren Farrell, um, you know, it's, there's a few captions here that I want to read out, uh, but 
for example, ADHD is 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 on the rise, and as boys be, as boys become young men, their suicide rates go from equal to the girls to six times that of young women. And that's that's global global statistics. So the boys' old sense of purpose, you know, whether it's being a warrior, a leader, a sole breadwinner, you know, all that is fading. Thick times are changing, uh, and many bright boys are experiencing a purpose void. You know, they're feeling alienated, withdrawn, and addicted to immediate gratification. And that immediate gratification can show up in, in numerous ways. And, you know, not, not least in social media. Um, as, as I'm sure you're, you're all aware, the debilitating effect that that ecosystem can have on, on a young mind. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, and this is a, an organization um, called the Band of Brothers uh, based here in the UK. They specialize primarily in, in young offenders and rehabilitating them into society. This is the, the, the other end of the spectrum. So we have the boys, but these are the men. And men, you know some of the statistics here are terrible. Men account for eight out of 10 people cautioned by the police and nearly nine out of 10 people found guilty for offenses are men. 80% of the homeless people in the UK are men. And tragically, men currently commit suicide at a rate of 13 per day in the UK. So that's one every two hours. You know, it's a shocking figure. And um, that figure is three times higher than, than it is for women. And the great Robert Bly, who recently passed, um, he wrote the book, I and John. And it's one of those staple books that is given to any men's work um, around the world. He said that by the time a man is 35, he knows that the image of the right man, the tough man, the true man, which he received at high school, do not work in life. And some do, some do realize that and some don't. Some go on to become presidents and stay acting as they would in the, in the playground. Um, but uh, needless to say, the, the, the psyche of, of the boy needs to mature and needs to evolve um, in a healthy way. And so at this point here, I just want to, you know, have a, have, a, have a discussion with some of the points that I've covered so far. I'm interested to, to hear from your perspective, your experiences, some of the things that, that you know are pertinent um, in, in a young man's life and that may be failing him. What are, what are some of those elements? Um, you know, I'm going to obviously cover... The, the rites of passage to do with, with this program, you know, the importance of community, brotherhood, you know, leadership, us, us as the adults, you know, what kind of examples are we setting for them? Where are their role models? So without further ado, I'm just going to, yeah, just have a, a open discussion here with whoever, if anyone's got anything that, that, that's come to their mind, please unmute and, uh, and fire away and uh, let's see, let's see what we can engage with. Who would like to go first? I will, buddy. I'll step out. Good man. Um, thanks for sharing your story, mate. I uh, appreciate that. And it's, I, mean, I don't know about the rest of the audience, but you're sharing that. I think it's incredibly brave, mate. So thanks very much. Um, well, I think there's a lot of system, a lot of the systems have let boys and girls down. You know, I had a terrible time at school. Um, and I think, you know, that's where a lot of these precedents and standards were set and met, you know, not just at the home. So these old antiquated systems in education, uh, poor, poor leadership, poor bosses, you know, from a young age, poor, having a paper round, having a bad boss at the post office, you know, it, all these little things affected children and, and you, you carry these weights, I see. So um, this change has to, you know, has to be at the at the young end of the spectrum, it's difficult to fix it now as adults, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, for me, it's like a multiple sort of um, approach throughout the entire life cycle of, 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 of a human, really. Um, if we can capture at an early age, good education, good emotional literacy at that early stage, you know, puts in foundations that will undoubtedly support you further down the line. But obviously, yeah, everybody's at different stages. And um, I think when addressing uh, a problem like this, it's, it's what one are you most aligned with, you know, if you are to address those problems and most relevantly align with. And for me, that's, that's where I feel like the transition points in any life are crucial. And I think one of the fundamental things that we've, in a Western society, 
really forgotten, really kind of, you know, some would say we civilized ourselves out of it, but the rites of passage of old ancient civilizations were there for a reason. Now there's an old town, uh, a town called Lewis, and they recognize the importance of rites of passage. And when the, the kids of that town go from small school to big school, the whole village comes out, the whole town comes out and they cheer them on, they have a parade and they initiate these, as, and they make them feel important. They may feel like they've gone through a transition. And it's when as a collective, as a society, we can make these transitions first and foremost in our, you know, in our awareness, in our collective awareness that there, there is a transition and that some of the emotions and some of the things you're gonna feel as you try and go through those transitions are normal. And you know, to give them tools to navigate those transitions, I think is, is fundamental. And this also applies to the veteran community. Like I said, I support them with that huge transition of reintegrating into society. And I really, you know, it sounds dramatic, reintegrating into society, but for some it really is. It's, it's, they, they cross that threshold alone and scared. And they, and they don't allow themselves to be scared because they're supposedly warriors and they're supposed to be tough. So, you know, immediately they, they go out and they don't have any of that, um, of that of those tools and that know-how to be able to navigate those transitions. So, yeah, anybody else Any, would like to add anything at this point? Um, I'm happy to chime in. Yeah. Um, look, I, I, I'm impressed with, um, with your endeavors this is a, a global issue uh, that is just, um, I think the scope and complexity of it would be very difficult for most to actually really comprehend. Uh, I think that um, societies wherever we are on the globe uh, are all going to be different challenges to incorporate different things. Um, I think that little things like what you just said then with regards to the um, older civilization methods of, like you mentioned, having the rites of passage and et cetera like that, they weren't just a, uh, they did have meaning, they did have purpose and they were um, often very effective. Uh, so they helped uh, people transition through. And in understanding that, I think you need to understand how those were a integrated part of the whole society. It wasn't just the male part of the population that were there. And I think this is where we get um, some real disconnect happening is that society can have be um, fragmented in its approach to some things, and that can be very difficult. But I think the, 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 like you mentioned also, the, the stage perspective of it. Now, I'm in my later life now, and I'm, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm still suffering from all the crap. Um, I only uh, two years ago um, decided to leave my family behind and no longer have anything to do with mothers or parents. Um, and it was just an, a dysfunctional part of it. And it was, I didn't realize it was holding me back until literally my partner just said, you can't allow yourself to be treated like this anymore. And that's an interesting thing that I only ever knew that. And like you mentioned, when you were going through stuff, you only know what you know being normal. And sometimes even if someone on the outside says that, and I didn't really realize it until I saw that behavior being transferred onto her. And then I got angry, but I wouldn't do that for myself. And that's the things, well, I'm sorry, I might've jumped, but the, the part where you mentioned the bits and pieces, education is I'm a person with neurodiversity, I've got neurological issues, I've got uh, bipolar, uh, da, 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 da. now there's a whole thing, background to uh, the psychology, the, the physiology, the, and many, many aspects of that. And I'm quite a diverse person when it comes to understanding those complexities. But it, we, if we can do things in stages to help, help kids and kids across the board, and it needs to be done, and I think it needs to be done in a way that 
almost minimizes the gender specificity of it. We know that that uh, boys, for instance, have different um, ways of dealing with their environment. It, it's a, just a natural thing, you know. It's called environmental psychology. It's like, you know, walking through a turnstile at a shopping centre. The height of the turnstile will affect the male differently to what it will affect the female. Your environment around you impacts you, but most people are unaware of how much that is. Uh, and we physiologically are very different. So by helping develop things for kids, like for me, it's, it's, it's crazy to have kids going into a learning environment and not having a baseline high level baseline understanding of their their listening capabilities their audio things and their visual capabilities and monitoring that as they're getting on because they can show different things but not only that it it enables us to then say well is it the physiological or is it something else and we need that information as people to be able to help kids because we don't have that connect with kids as much anymore because the, the teachers are less connected with kids. Yeah, I mean... And stuff, so... Yeah, for sure, I agree. And, and I mean, the complexity of it is for certain, is undoubtedly a thing. It's a feature, unbelievable, yeah. you know, undoubtedly. And uh, I agree, it, the old saying, it takes a village. It takes a village to, to bring up a child. Um, and by me, you know, it's it's by me focusing on men only. I by no means exclude it, the the women. It, for me, you know, I have uh, I have my elders, I have my my female support, I have my my wisdom teachers, and but also in the program as we, as I'll come on to shortly. You know, it's not just the child on its own, and it's not just the boy. You know, it is it is the mother, it is the father. Um, in the involvement but um but yeah i appreciate your points it is a, it is a complex um multifaceted multi-layered multicultural um thing but at some point you know one has to zero down on the particular path that that is in alignment with their skills and gifts and, and focus on 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 that okay um kate i know you raised your hand if you would like to yeah thank you um and good evening everyone um, I, you know, I've worked in mental health for quite some time and um, my career was spent as a social worker, I'm now coaching and um, work at a mental health, you know, professional advisor level. And I was really interested in your topic, you know, and you talk about the becoming the men we need. And I think that's, that's the interest for me that we have all of the, I mean, Michael has talked about the environmental issues, the familial issues, the relational issues. Um, I think as someone who, you know, has, I have nephews who are now 18, 19. Um, I have a brother-in-law who was in the, the armed forces. So interesting, that very macho image that, you know, my nephews are struggling with, yeah. you know, in some respects, which again was a, you know, an attraction to your, to your talk tonight to see how do you, you know, in some ways, um, very okay with, you know, young people, young adults who grow up with adult, you know, um, childhood adverse events in their lives and how that impacts on them. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you would have a view in terms of going to war, how much of an adverse event and trauma, you know, that is um, in your life. So trauma-informed practice is something that I try and, you know, think about. But um, for lots of young people out there in society, not even just within deprived areas, um, life is a challenge. Um, and do they have influential adults in their lives that can steer them, can guide them? Um, again, I think one of the, um, I think it was Michael talked about teachers and, and the role that, that we have to play. So, yeah, really interested in that whole, um, sometimes quite gender specific, you know, role that um, young men are expected to, um, to show in society and how their peers, you know, give them a really hard time if, if they don't. Um, you use the word, you know, um, I think in your uh, blog or, or your your ad for this around vulnerability, um, and I'd be keen to hear from you in terms of how you've got in touch with your vulnerability and you know where that comes from and and how can we how can we pass some you know tools techniques and skills on to to yeah. other young people? Thank mm. you. Thank you. Yeah, valid points. I mean, the vulnerability piece is something that you know it did take me uh, many years to unravel from 
uh, the connotation of vulnerability equals weakness. You know, that association was was drummed into me. Uh, and, and, you know, necessarily so for the machine of the military, right? Um, you know, when, when you show vulnerability on the battlefield in an extreme situation, um, immediately the people around you will start freaking out because they can't rely on you, you know? So that that on that perspective, that's the extreme pointy end of it. But actually it trickles down into society, you know? That, 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 that perception, that public perception or con subconscious projection of what a man should be is it needs to be revisited, re-educated. And being vulnerable is, is ultimately when you relate to your vulnerability is your strength, actually. You know, being able to access that vulnerability with the tools, with the, with the guidance, um, you know, it does become a fountain of strength and resources, knowing that you can give yourself the psychological, emotional capacity to feel more and be okay with it that capacity increase increases your resilience to life and you're able to enjoy more life and be more in life so you know that's not an easy thing um, but there are tools there are processes and and you know that that's covered in 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 what I hope to present a little bit more of um, in this program so unless anyone else got anything else we'll move on um it's good to get that engagement i really like uh, the participation aspects of of these um, events because it's it, it's always something that's gleaned from from these interactions so i appreciate that um okay so we'll go back to presentation <clears throat> okay great stuff and so the solution and obviously that's a bold statement, isn't it? The solution. There are many, many different solutions, but I feel like if we're all contributing in our own way, I think, um, you know, that's how do you eat an elephant kind of scenario, you know, one bite at a time. And for me, the solution that I'm presenting here is a 12 week group program. It's online program designed to take young men through a transformative process of self discovery, empowerment and growth. It's, uh, it's supported ultimately by an ancient code that provides a framework really. And there's 12 fundamental values that will give the life skills, the awareness and resilience needed to become whole as a person and confident as a man. And so what are these, what are these values? What are these, what, are, what is this code? Um, without going into too much of the origin of this code and how it was passed down to me and how it's been implemented over the years, but I will just go through them now. It starts with courage, loyalty, virtue, authority, service, nobility, humility, grace, truth, courtesy, honor, and gallantry. These are the 12 fundamental values that ultimately make a chivalrous man. And chivalry is, is a concept that is... Um, well, we all have a relationship, I guess, at some level. Some don't even know what it means anymore. But chivalry featured, you know, especially in my grandparents' uh, vocabulary very much. And um, it's my intention with my deep study into this code to bring that back and in, in integrate that into young men's lives um, with these fundamental 12 values. Um, so really, the, the program itself consists of weekly calls um uh, you know they're planned and purposeful series of 12 sessions as a group um it's, it's designed to be accessible and practical um and accessible from home so they're within the comfort of their own house which has um which has a very powerful effect uh you know just being able to feel that little bit safer um and ultimately because of the practicalities of covid and you know where we are in this current time, not being able to be uh, in groups as often, although hopefully that's changing soon. Um, but it's also in between those calls, they're gonna have weekly tasks, a series of challenges to accomplish in between each session. And it's really to help them embody the code of chivalry. Um, each, each week we'll deep, deep dive into these values and, and then they'll be given a task and with the community that's gonna be formed around these young men, and, uh, you know, they will have accountability surrounded by like-minded men to have that support and growth. And that's a growing community that's made up of a variety of ages. 
um, and backgrounds, uh, and that is continuously growing in partnership with with my the people that I collaborate with um, uh, and mentors, etc. Uh, and it's a it's a very powerful um, community that we're growing to the point where sometime in the next year, around September, we're hoping to do actual live events uh, and gatherings around up and down the country. Um, in collaboration with with other organizations so it really is uh, a growing community and it needs to be that way like i said earlier the village it takes a village and um so what are, what do they become what are the what are the results to to be expected you know um ultimately my vision um is is to 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 make create tomorrow's leaders to help them you know become reliable trustworthy you know care for their environment um be there for others, engage in non-toxic relationships to even understand what a toxic relationship is, live without addictions, be more resilient, more positive about life in general, know the difference between power and force uh, and become essentially the men that we all need. And um, really to, to know more about this, um, uh, the best thing to do is, is to arrange a discovery call with myself. Um, I'm going to provide you, you guys with the link um, shortly. Uh, and really that discovery call, it was my intention or it is my intention to, to have on there, you know, the, the, the young man and the parent or, you know, if ideally that would be the ideal thing because the, the, the idea really is to, I'm going to stop sharing this quickly. Uh, the idea really is to involve the parents in this, um, very much like a rite of passage where the, where the parents hand over their, their child into that initiatory kind of process. And, um, you know, uh, it's a collaborative thing. It's a collaborative thing. And, and you know, together put, put in their, their young sons in, the, in trusting into my, into my care and my program is, is a collaborative thing. So um, I'll, what I'll do is I'm going to leave uh, the link to, to book a discovery call if yourself um, or somebody you know could benefit from that. And it's really just to, just to explore, just to explore the, the program in depth, their situation, where they're at. Um, and, you know, there's a variety of financial sort of um, structures for that. Um, but like I said, it's over three months and, um, you know, uh, the maximum capacity, each program is 14, 14 uh, uh, at a time i will be i will be you know doing probably i think at the moment the capacity is probably three running concurrent programs um at most because there are anything beyond that it's too much of a stretch because it is quite intensive um to make sure that they're supported in the right way despite the fact i do have um support around that um and so so yeah so if you guys uh, did you get that link everybody had access to that link if you can capture that before it goes um yeah cool um but yeah if if you guys got any any final questions or anything um that really concludes uh the presentation i wasn't sure how many people would show up so i didn't want to uh, make it a, a too much of a, a presentation because you know i'd rather get engagement um with those that show up but um yeah kate please yeah um I mean, obviously I'm taken by the idea of, of coaching for young men um, and to make them leaders of tomorrow and, and you know, to work out those authoritative um, you know, questions that they might have. There's two things for me, um, just in terms of, is group work the right format? You know, young men working in peers, embarrassment, you know, all the things that, that come into that. Um, and, you know, just maybe a challenge to yourself in terms of the use of the word chivalry um, as a, female you know and maybe my sister as a parent would think well chivalry is something that is um, potentially old-fashioned um, it's potentially something that would be criticized in young men today given that on the opposite side we have very strong females who want to be treated as equals so it's just to maybe a bit of feedback in terms of that terminology um, me for one I, I would find it would jar with me um, in terms of uh, any young man in our family coming, I, I just want to be chivalrous when actually want to move them beyond the chivalry to equality to, you know, um, a bit of e um, equal respect. So just some feedback, Adam, if that's okay. 
Sure. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It's um, it's not the first time I've heard that response um, to to that to that word. And it's my mission to reclaim that for what it truly is. And um, and there is a big misunderstanding with chivalry and it's gone through an evolution um, in our society in particular that I believe has been distorted. And, you know, um, so chivalry is is by no means um, putting men better than or more powerful than uh, anyone else. It's it's giving them qualities of, you know, and values to make them upstanding citizens, you know, to make them uh, truly noble in service, um, to have a grasp of authority in a way that they don't need to use their power or their force onto somebody else. Authority is something that is given to you by your actions. It's somebody that is actually you're empowered by your community gives you authority rather than you taking that authority and imposing it on someone else. So, yeah, it's, there's many, many dynamics um, within the 12 you know, uh, values of chivalry. And like I said, it's an ancient code and the actual origins of it is through Merlin's code, and that is the Arthurian legend. King Arthur and, and, and the 12 knights, that's actually what the story and the narrative where it originates from. Um, and of course, there is, there is some aspects to chivalry that, like I said, need to be reclaimed and, uh, re and understood. Um, this is by no means the solution, the answer, but I do believe it to be a, a fundamental structure that we can lean on in order to provide a framework for, for young men. You know, we need to give them some kind of framework and guidance and um, in collaboration with the modern world as well. You know, it has to be fit for service. It has to be relevant. It has to take into account um, the cultural changes. Um, do I believe that men and women are equal in all respects? No. I, I just I don't think that serves anyone to, to believe that. Do I believe that women are capable as men for, for all jobs? No. You know, um, there, there are some extreme cases where women have gone on the front line in war and made it to the elite units. I've seen that. I've served alongside them. And they've served better than some men. But these are, these are um, definitely outliers. And to shape an entire society based on a politically correct narrative is, can, be, can be dangerous. It can be, uh, create a distortion field. That, that really, when we boil down to it, really muddies the water, it confuses people. It just, it's, it's, you know, it makes you feel uncomfortable. I deal, like I said, I deal with, um, with DEFRA and Project Race, and I'm inv highly involved with their inclusion and diversity programs. And so I come across every day, you know, this tension in that space between somebody wanting to show up to work, be authentic, and, and not being able to, whether that's because they're a minority or whether that's because they're a white man. There's this incredible tension. The white man has no voice anymore in that space. He can't speak anything because of you know, uh, his background and his inherit, inherited blame. And you know, it's, it's very, it, gets, it goes from being complex to complicated. And I think we can avoid complication, but complexity is, is, is life. Life is complex. There's no doubt, but to unnecessarily complicate it, I think that's when we start to blend the political with the ideology, with the narrative. And really for me, ultimately chivalry is, is being able to be your authentic self also, but also to be coming from a place of love, actually, you know, um, and it starts with being able to love yourself first. And if we can't love ourselves, there is, it's very little chance that you're going to be able to really be of service and love others um, in the way we need. Um, um, so, yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay. And the other, yeah, thank you. And the other, the other point you mentioned about um, the group setting and uh, I like, I like that question. And, and it, and it's, and it's uh, for me, the way I see it, when, there are a number of, of dynamics that favor 
be in a group setting. For me, that being uncomfortable, being um, close to feelings, a sense of shame, embarrassment, all of those shadow emotional responses are coming up. If they come up, that's great. Now we can see them. They're in the light. We can navigate them. But once you, you know, a rites of passage back in, you know, an original rites of passage would mean a dissolution of who you are as your identity gets dissolved, but alongside others. So you get torn down together and built back up. Now, I'm not saying to do anything as extreme as that because that leaves certain scars, you know, um, but, but, but the, the, the mechanics of that is that, you know, you, you, you struggle together, you know, that's a very, that is the beginning of brotherhood. Um, and a sense of belonging is important for, for, for community, for, for mental health, of, you know, for mental wellness, um, it's, it's important. And so the group setting really provides a dynamic um ex experience for everyone in the group and a long-lasting one they then become part of you know the guys that went through the prodigal sons or the guys that went through knighthood which is the next level up you know or kingship which is the one aimed for ceos and and current leaders you know which is another one that we do and so you know all of these become whether it's digital or occasionally in person when we can, they become communities and the communities are the, are the backbone to this whole entire process and this mission. Um, and also I would say the other dynamic, because I have one-on-one -on -one clients, I do also one-on-one -on -one, um, clients. And with the one-on-one -on -one clients, we go deeper. Um, and with the group settings, you go less deep, but, but broader. Um, so you, you know, you enter the realm of deep therapy with the one-on-ones, but as a collective, it's less therapeutic, more coaching, more teaching. So the dynamics are slightly different in that regard. Um, but also the group thing for me, what it offers is, is scale, not just the econ economy of scale, but you know, at scale, it's more affordable, but at scale, you're reaching more people. So, you know, we want, this program is the flagship to, you know, in about a, a I'd say probably about a year's time, we will be, coaching coaches to deliver this program um, nationally. Um, I already have uh, connections in Australia and America that, you know, we're, we're looking to collaborate and expand this as well. Um, so, you know, it's an evolving and growing scalable solution. Um, and it's not perfect. I, I know that, you know, but it's, but it's, uh, it's, it's progress and it's movement in that direction. Um, and it, and it's and it's based it's also based on on my experience with my one on one clients you know yeah. young men and and the patterns that go through that but um but yes um really no, I mean, enjoyed um, thank absolutely. you yeah, sorry go ahead no just good to say thank you for that and um um all of what you see is 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 challenging and um to to go back to the complexity of it yeah. i think if you if you unpack it as a as a complexity then it helps people, you take people with you on that rather than it being polar ideas, especially yeah. for young men, um, you know, that it's either this, it's either black or white or it's either this or that. Um, so I think that's good to hear. Um, and the application of, of you know, a, a programme like this, um, especially having worked in, you know, mental health where young men tragically, uh, 14 to 24, you, you mentioned the stats in terms of suicide, um, it is extremely worrying. How do you, you know, build young men up, you know, in terms of their own psyche, their self worth, their self esteem, yeah. um, when society does almost the opposite, you know, for for a lot of young people. So, um, and the fact that you're on this journey when you know that it's not perfect is is a great thing because, um, you know, young people will get that humility from you, and um, you know they'll 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 get a growth that, that goes with that. So. Um, I wish you every luck with it, and um, I will certainly have discussions where, where you know, I think it's necessary to to point people, maybe signpost some people to the to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, so much. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Well. Okay. If anybody else has got anything else they want to, before we wrap up, want to mention. If not, thank you. Yeah, Faye. Uh, thank you for this. It's great. I just want to know a couple of maybe impacts that have happened as a result of working with young men so far, maybe with your clients, what the impacts has been um, in, in working with adolescents? Mm, yeah, it's a good one. Um, 
look, a lot of them, when you're dealing with, with this type of work, a lot of it becomes pattern recognition. You know, there's a lot of repeat patterns and, and you can see their behaviors and a lot of them come to me with, um, you know, self-worth, right? That's like the number one low self-esteem or self-worth. Um, and it's for me, one of the biggest moments that happens in this process is when they become aware, so they become aware of themselves for the first time. It's like, oh, that's who I am. And it's that process of like uh, fully understanding themselves and radiating out from that place. Because up to that point, they were the other way around. They were completely affected by their environment. What are my mates going to think of me if I cut my hair this way? What, am, what are they going to say if I wear this? What if, you know, it's constantly reacting to an external stimulus of sorts, whatever that may be. And so, you know, the big shift that I see often is that fundamental flip um that they go through and and from that place it's now we starting to build from the core out um and and you know that that's that's something that's apparent consistently um and yeah i mean i'm i'm actually blown away by the by the the willingness actually to go there once you once you're able to demonstrate and and build trust with them their willingness to go there and do the work and, and actually put in put in the effort and and you know once they're on that that road um it's it's super encouraging to see them grow you know so i don't know if that answered your question or not yeah thank you that's great mm -hmm. okay thank you brilliant all right guys all right i'm gonna jump off thank you so much and um yeah just keep an eye out for any other news and anything coming because there'll be more to to announce okay Thanks, um, can I just say yeah. that um, I can't see the link. So, is there any way that you could maybe just tell us what the link is? Um, it's a it's a bit of oh, you can't see the chat. Is that I right? Can't, well, I can see the chat, but I don't see the link. Okay, all oh, right. Let me. There you go. I'll do it again there. For some reason, I'm not seeing it in the version that I've got. I can maybe come back on later and. And have a look at it but even if you could put it on linkedin that would be I'll helpful. put it on linkedin as well yeah yeah okay brilliant thanks very much all right good night everybody. Thank, you. thank you very much bye bye